I immediately. And a lot of, I guess, mostly if you've ever come on campus, you would see uh, that we have a very large yard here and the upkeep of the, the landscape is beautiful and as well as the architecture. But during that time, Tillotson College was not upkept. Um, there was an immense amount of work to be done. Uh, the buildings were falling apart. There were like the grass, the weeds, everything about the college was um, unpleasant at the time in her words. <laughs> and, um, but when she stepped on campus, she mentions in a book called, um, a book that uh, Mary, Mary Jenis has written um, in an interview, she mentions that she knew that she had to really um, dedicate her, her time to upkeep the design of this, this excellent institution. So that was actually one of the, the first things that she, um, that she decided to um, develop and, and just regenerate. It was the beautification of the, the college. And um, it really also uh, regenerated the, uh, the slogan of uh, Tillotson College sitting on Blue Bonnet Hill. Um, and that is still a slogan that we, we use today. Um, and then uh, shortly after another great design of hers was um, building the library. Um, and we're going to introduce uh, Dr. Hudson and she can talk about that a bit more, but it's a very intricate component of, uh, of the university itself, especially now because um, I work in the library and so many of our resources live in the library as well. Um, and then in 1935, she, she also uh, creates a co-ed student population again. And she hires so many um, um, black professors and staff to manage the library, but also to teach classes. And she was able to, she had so many um, like resources outside of the university. So she was able to reach out to different uh, reverends and friends of hers, like from Virginia and Kansas, where she taught, um, to ask for donations for, um, for, for the upkeeping of the, the library and to enhance the development of its collection. Um, she also successfully recruits uh, academically successful students and, um, and scholars, and then by um, I guess the actually the 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 population of the students rises uh, from eight ninety eight students in nineteen twenty nine to one hundred and thirty nine by nineteen thirty, and then to six hundred by nineteen forty four, which was her last year as uh, serving as president. Um, but the um, the reverence in which people have talked about uh, Dr. E. Branch, um, they also, they've, they've mentioned that she was a humble yet um, strong and, and well-spoken woman um, who was a very, actually uh, a mother, a mother figure to many of the students on campus. And they also called her Mama Branch sometime. Um, but she left a, a great legacy here um, on campus and um, we have a gymnasium named after her, but also we have uh, many portraits in the archive, um, two particularly uh, that, um, oh, actually two, two in the archive and then one in the president's office. And then there's another portrait inside of the gymnasium. Uh, but she was the, the first, um, the first female uh, president of the college. And then um, now we have Dr. Colette Pierce Burnett as our second, so. And so I would really like to introduce uh, Dr. Julie Hudson. She's our Associate uh, Professor of English um, here at Houston Tillotson University. And she's done immense work on Dr. Branch's um, tenure and also her, her legacy on the library. 
Thank you, Ms. Brown. And uh, also thank you, uh, Ms. Marshall, for inviting me to participate in this event. Um, I've been at, at, at Houston Tillotson for many, many years. And oftentimes when I walked across campus, I would see Dr. Branch's name on the, gen on the gymnasium. Mary E. Branch. And so I wondered who is who is who is Mary E. Branch? So I started to do some investigative work about our first black woman president. And as I as I've done research on her on her, I I've come to realize that Houston Tillotson University would not be the institution it is today without her leadership during the period from 1930 to 1944. Um, I'm in the process of doing some research with regard to how she, how she began the library, Tillotson College's library. Um, the important words, years of that particular um, success with regard to Dr. Branch is 1934 and 1935. As Ms. Brown said, she first came to, to HT or to Tillotson College in 1930, and then her administration ended in 1944. But once she arrived on campus, one of her first projects was to create a library for her students. And I was very pleased to see that, that photograph at the beginning of, of, of the presentation where Dr. Branch is standing in front of a group of black women. Her purpose, once she, when she arrived at eight, at, 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 yes, thank you, thank you. Once she arrived at Tillotson College, it was her mission because at that time Tillotson College, well, its purpose was to teach black women to become teachers in the Austin and Central Texas community. And so the purpose, so one of the, the, the basic necessities to create this class of teachers was to create a library that would allow them to have the kind of education she thought was necessary. An interesting point that I, that I learned about Dr. Branch was that she was a supporter of W.E.B. Du Bois and his idea of the Talented Tenth. And the Talented Tenth was a group, was supposed to be a group of black people, the top 10% of black communities who would lead the rest of the black community in terms of education, economic success, and so on and so forth. So what she, so what, what, what is very interesting about Dr. Branch is that she, she placed an ad, an advertisement in the Congregationalist newspaper, uh, which is now known as the United Church of Christ. But back in 1934, she placed an ad in the Congregationalist newspaper asking for books. And so what is interesting, what I discovered is that at least two people responded to her, her request for books. The first gentleman is the name, was named George F. Work, W-O-R-K. And what is interesting about him is that he was, he was a, a captain during the Civil War and he led Negro troops during the, during the Civil War. And so I mentioned this is because, because he believed it was his mission to help black people uplift themselves through education. So he sent her two letters. The first one was in February of 1934, telling her that he had read her ad in the newspaper. There's, she does respond to Mr. Work and, say, and, and thanks him for donating the books that he will be sending to the college. He, find, he sends a, a response to her response saying that he is grateful to be able to participate in her project to create this library. The second person who responded to Dr. Branch's request for books is a woman by the name of, her name was Mrs. Charles L. Vile, V-I-L-E, I think it's V-I-L-E-S. Uh, Mr. Work was out of Nebraska and Mrs. Charles Viles was out of um, Massachusetts. What's interesting about her correspondence with Dr. Branch is that she, she 
also mentions the fact that she read, read of her request in the newspaper. But then she transitions to talking about the weather in Massachusetts. And the reason I mention this is because the tone of the letter written by Mrs. Viles is one seems to be, well, not seems to be, but one of familiarity and friendship. And what is interesting is that these two women never met each other, but, but the tone of Mrs. Viles letter, and, and in fact, Mr. George's letter also, there's a tone of, in both letters, a tone of respect for what Dr. Branch was attempting to do and, a, and, a, and, I, and I say Christian willingness to help her because both of these respondents talk about um, their membership in their church, their membership in Sunday school class, the fact that they are part of the missionary groups and so on and so forth. So I would like to suggest that both of these people considered it to be their Christian mission to help Dr. Branch create her library. Secondly, what is interesting, and, and Ms. Brown mentioned this, is that when Dr. Branch arrived on campus, she was, she was discouraged to say the least. And so what she also did is um, in 1935, there's two sketches of the campus. There's one sketch that is, is, is a rough draft. And, and in that draft, you have uh, a legend that has, the, num that has the, the number of buildings and what each building will, 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 will include. And in building number nine, she includes the administration, classrooms, the chapel, and the library. Then there's a second sketch. It is a more complete sketch, but still, the library is still in building number nine, which includes classrooms, the administration, the chapel, and the library. Um, by 19, if I remember correctly, by 1945 or either 1945, or at least at the end of Dr. Branch's administration, the library grew to at least, I, I, I wanna say 40, 4,000 or 45,000, I need to look at my notes. But the point is that once, after she arrived on campus, it was her mission to create a library that included books that allowed her, her, her black women students to have a classical education. And this is important to remember, especially with regard to the, the economic environment at that particular time. Um, um, I was kind, I'm kind of disheartened that the, the gym is named after Dr. Branch, as opposed to the library. Our library is known as the Downs Jones Library. And if it were my, my wish, if I could wave a magic wand, I would have the name of the, the gym changed to Downs Jones and the name of the library to Mary E. Branch. Today, our library is outstanding. Um, when I first arrived at, at on campus many years ago, there was something known as the Negro Collection. And many of those books came out of the, the work that Dr. Branch, Dr. Branch um, did during her tenure. Um, many of those books have, been, have, have either been given out to the public or or whatever, I have some of those books at home in my own library. But the point is that what Dr. Branch started in 1934 and 1935 has grown into an outstanding library in 2022. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you, Dr. Hudson. We're definitely gonna, um, it, it, it's very meaningful to know her legacy is still, you're still benefiting from it. And the li I agree, the library should be named after, <laughs> after her. I thought the same thing initially when I saw the name for the gymnasium, but um, I mean, it's, it's wonderful work that she began and that the school itself is still 
the, you know, the keeper of the flames, you know, that's the preservation. And I really see Dr. Um, Branch as a designer. She was a designer of so many different things um, in the arts and humanities and education, uh, the landscape of the school. So I'm gonna go through so you can kind of see, we touched on some of her initiatives. Um, this is a photograph here um, during 1931 um, of some graduates um, during Dr. Branch's tenure. She also was responsible for allowing um, sororities and fraternities, Greek life at the college. And um, so, this is a representation of one of the uh, fraternities, Omega Psi Phi, one of their charters. Um, she brought that to the school during her tenure. Um, this is a photograph, um, I believe the last year the school was called Tillotson College before it changed over um, to co-ed the following year um, under Dr. Branch's direction. Um, these are students in front of the old administration building here. Um, when it was still a women's college, but this is the last year before it became co-ed. And then, um, so she, she did a lot of initiatives um, inside and outside of the school. And um, I guess I'll touch on about the accreditation that she was the, uh, got this school ranked. She was the only black female president of a senior college to get the school accredited by the um, SACSS. Um, am I correct? And yeah. so that's through her initiatives of hiring new faculty, raising the level of um, success, the level of uh, renovating the buildings, expanding the library, um, just a rigorous, a rigorous campaign. I, it, it just amazes me. I feel that she's a kindred spirit because when I took on preservation work in the cemetery, um, the cemetery has so many different components within it. And I really connected with Dr. Branch um, and, her, and her, her strength and her fortitude and her tenacity. So here's a photograph of Dr. Branch. Um, she's seated fourth from the left and she's um, among some of her faculty here. And then, so I wanted to touch on um, briefly the connection to this area, as I mentioned earlier in, in our program about um, Dr. Branch had um, a brother and his name was Clement T. Branch, T for Taswell. So his middle name is his father's first name. He's named after his father. Um, Dr. Clement T. Branch um, was a prominent physician. Um, born in Farmville, Virginia. He moved, migrated, like I said, up to the North, originally to Jersey City. Um, he was born in 1869, um, so he was her elder brother. And he was a doctor in Jersey City for a number of years. Then he came down to Camden, New Jersey. Um, he was educated in the public school system in Farmville, just like um, Dr. Mary and her and their other siblings. Um, Dr. Clement T. Branch, studied at Shaw University, Cornell University, and Howard University. Um, he graduated in 1900. Um, he married a young lady named Bessie Avery, who was also a school teacher, um, and she was from Petersburg, Virginia. Um, Dr. Branch came to Camden, New Jersey, and he was well known during the early half of the 20th century, um, became one of the uh, first members, African-American members of the Camden School Board after the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and he sat on the school board. He was instrumental in um, hiring black firemen, policemen, and essentially um, getting the city of Camden black men opportunities um, in positions um, in, in Camden, education positions, civil Positions. Um, Dr. Clement T. Branch was responsible for that. Also, he was a very well known physician, um, and so much so that when he passed in 1940, um, he had uh, a housing development was on, named in his honor. So, for those of you from the South Jersey area, and have heard of Clement T. Branch or AKA Branch Village. This is 
who it's named for. This is Dr. Clement T. Branch. Um, if this was a housing development started in the 40s um, for low income housing, um, mainly for underrepresented, underrepresented families. And Branch Village has gone through uh, a number of, uh, I should say, transformations over the years. And as you can see, the photographs here kind of start from the mid 20th century. And on the bottom left, this is how Branch Village looks today. Um, Branch Village still exists. Um, they reconfigured, um, this is actually the groundbreaking ceremony when they reconfigured the uh, landscape, their townhomes. It's still a place for families um, um, that need, um, that are low income, um, a development for families that need a safe place to live. So that's the legacy of Dr. Clement T. Branch, um, Dr. Mary's um, brother. And Dr. Clement T. Branch is also buried in Mount Peace Cemetery. Um, he's actually, um, I would say, probably about eight feet in proximity to where Dr. Mary is buried. So this is the headstone of Dr. Clement T. Branch. He's um, buried with his wife, Bessie, and the name you see to the top right is another sibling named John, John Branch, um, who also migrated from Farmville, Virginia, came up to the north, settled in Camden. Um, and John, their brother, is buried in this plot here. Um, so some of Dr. Mary's um, namesakes um, as the ladies mentioned, she taught at an elementary school. There's a school in Farmville, Virginia that's named for Dr. Mary. Um, this is the school here. Um, the school originally was called the Farmville Colored School. Um, and then this building was um, erected in 1926 for grades eight through 11. Um, then it was renamed the Robert Brusa Moton High School. Um, then they built another school across the street for the high school. And then in 1939, when that opened, they renamed the smaller school after Dr. Mary E. Branch, who was a native of Farmville, Virginia. Um, Branch Hall in Virginia State University. Um, there is a, a freshman female residence that's named for Dr. Mary Branch that was erected during the 1949-50 um, semester year. Um, it's a residence wing that still stands today and bears the name. She taught at Virginia State University for 20 years before coming to Houston Tillotson, which was then known as Tillotson College. And um, she also taught at a high school in Kansas called Vachon, Vachon High School. And she taught there. That school was actually um, the first high school in the country for African-American um, African Americans. Um, so, Dr. Branch is a very, very, very prominent figure. So, um, you're going to see her name kind of come up in many different places across the United States. <laughs> so, as the ladies mentioned, this is the um, gym um, at Houston Tillotson Gymnasium, is named for Dr. Barry Branch. And also in 2017 in Austin, there is a three and a half acre park. Um, that was created and is named after Dr. Mary E. Branch. It's a beautiful park. Um, it's a, a mixed media park. Um, it has waterfalls. It's made with recycled materials. Um, and it's just a place for families to enjoy green space and the natural beauty of Austin, Texas. So I think that's amazing that there's a park named for her. And these are some of the newspaper articles at the time when Dr. Mary Branch had passed in 1944. Um, and you can see um, that it was covered um, in several papers. Um, you see at the top. So the story um, goes, Dr. Mary Branch needed an operation and she traveled up to Camden City. Um, her sister Hattie, who was also a school teacher um, and she lived in Morristown. She traveled to stay with her sister while she was having her operation. Unfortunately, the operation um, had some complications and Dr. Mary um, died um, as a result of that. And she was 
buried in Mount Peace. Now Mount Peace um, at the time was the only African-American cemetery, well cemetery that was a cemetery that would allow African-Americans to be, be buried in New Jersey. So I, 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 I'm kind of wondering, you know, the reasoning behind why she's buried in Mount Peace. And I, through my research, you know, I understand because her, at that time, Dr. Clement T. Branch, her brother was already deceased and he was buried already um, in, in Mount Peace. So I assumed that they had, you know, family plots. And this is what um, you have to know about preservation. A lot of people would, you know, buy their funeral plots, you know, ahead of time, you know, ahead of time. And they would have that. That's just one thing, one less thing to be concerned with, um, to have when it's your time to have your, your, your plot and to have your arrangements made. So, um, Dr. Mary was buried in Mount Peace, um, and, and the, this is her obituary in the middle here. And this I think is beautiful about, I think um, six or seven months after Dr. Mary died, the school released a memorial edition of their um, paper, the bulletin, and I'm just gonna read it. Um, it's in honor of Dr. Mary. This bulletin is dedicated to the memory of President Mary E. Branch. As a token of our appreciation of her as an executive, she was forceful and efficient. As a companion, she was genial and kind. And as a friend, she was loyal and true. To know her was to be influenced by her. To meet her daily on the campus was to learn to live on a higher plane, loyal to God, to her friends and to herself. She inspired others with her sense of responsibility and sacrificial service. President Branch was untiring in her efforts to improve the college. She left a record of outstanding achievement in educational, civic and religious circles. We are poorer now that she has gone from us. And I also wanna make mention that Dr. Branch was appointed. Um, she was a, a prominent member of the Austin chapter of the NAACP. And she also was appointed to the Negro Youth um, Association by then Senator Lyndon B. Johnson. And she also was instrumental in the creation of the United Negro College Fund. Oh, and this is um, a photograph of uh, Dr. Mary um, E. Branch's headstone in Mount Peace Cemetery in Lawnside, New Jersey. And next to her is her sister, Hattie. And she also had a sister named Helen that was a, a elementary school teacher in Lawnside too. So I'm still doing research to locate all of the siblings, um, but um, stay tuned because they're, they're, they're their family is a story of great achievement, contribution to society educationally, civically. Um, and it's just a joy to be able to restore these hidden narratives through these type of um, programs. So I'm gonna open the floor. If, if you ladies wanna add anything, um, we can take some questions and answers or if you wanna add anything to, um, the conversation, we have um, plenty of time. Oh yeah, I did also want to add that somewhere between 1942 and 1943, she was awarded her doctorate of pedagogy from Virginia State College and then her doctorate of law from Howard University. Mm. So that's why we have Dr. Branch. Yeah. And Dr. Judson, tell us um, what, your inspiration was initially for writing the book. I know you said you mentioned seeing the portraits, but um, but tell us about you know your your process. It's been how long have you been writing and researching? Uh, my process uh, for writing about Dr. Branch began maybe I want to say maybe two or three months ago. Oh, okay. Um, um, and so. Um, as I as I read more about her, I, I I learned about her her work with the library, and so that's that's primarily what I'm interested in with regard to Dr. Branch, is because of um, she was she was a force to create the library at Tillotson College, and also the reason 
her reasoning behind creating the, the, the college, meaning she was interested in a classical education for black women. I don't think I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, but I, um, I, I teach African-American lit and my focus is African-American women. And so I'm always very interested in those stories about black women, especially those black women who, who saw it as their mission to help other black women succeed. And so this is, that, that is the primary reason for me focusing on, on Dr. Branch. Also, um, uh, I, think, I think telling the stories of, of black women, telling the narratives of black women is important because oftentimes the stories about black women are ignored or uh, half told or not told. So I think it's important that we tell what role Dr. Branch play, played and I say plays also in, in, in Houston Tillotson University and uh, how she's a role model for, for our black women students, for our black faculty and just being an important figure from, from the history of the college. That is, that's amazing. And, and Bria, can you touch on a little bit more about like the, the campus life or maybe about the, how aware is the student body of like Dr. Branch's legacy? Would you say in your opinion? Um, just from the few months that I've been in this uh, position at the institution, um, not very people, not very many students know about Dr. Branch. Uh, besides the fact that there's a gymnasium named after her and that she was the only president before Dr. Burnett uh, at Tillotson College. Um, but I do know that a few faculty members, especially Dr. Burnett, our president knows, um, knows a, a more in-depth stories about Dr. Branch, but there's, there's the story about her, her legacy here, but of course, um, there were other parts of her life that she was really able to leave a legacy with, like, for instance, in Virginia um, and New Jersey as well. So um, I think in that retrospect, like this was this lecture would be beneficial um, just for students to be aware of, to know how, like what kind of designs uh, she implemented on the campus and how we're seeing that legacy today. Exactly. And then tell us about, um, there is an oral history program. I think people Absolutely. are wanting, yeah, tell us about that and Dr. Branch's connection about that. The legacy is still living on, <laughs> continuing. So um, the, the institution um, is actually launching a oral history program pretty soon um, um, under the administration of Dr. Burnett. And um, actually one of the interviewees or yeah, the interviewees uh, is a, was a student under Dr. Branch during that time. Uh, her, her name is Miss Johnny Meter. Um, so keep a lookout for that. Uh, we'll, we'll make these oral histories accessible on our digital repository, which provided a link in the chat. Um, but we will also, um, hold there's initiative to go through a very long list of um, alumni, faculty, and staff who have served uh, as Houston Tillotson, uh, well, at Houston Tillotson uh, College, but also went to school at Houston Tillotson College uh, before it became a university or um, at Tillotson College. So um, yeah. That's amazing. It's important that we preserve these narratives um, so that people can not only um, listen to them now, but for future generations um, to have as a resource. So that's wonderful. Um, that's an initiative that Mount Peace um, is involved in with our, our preservation. Um, these stories are important because without research and people um, 
actively working to preserve them, they'll be forgotten, they'll be lost. So thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna open the floor um, to um, our audience. Um, do you have any questions? <laughs> Um, please, um, you can type them in the chat or you can, I'm going to stop the screen here. You can type them in the chat or you can raise your hand, whatever you feel comfortable with, because we are here to answer your questions or if you want to make a comment or if you're interested about preservation or anything, we want to hear from you. Yeah, go ahead, Jay. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank the uh, presenters this evening. I think you did a fantastic job. Um, everyone brought out some very key points, you know, about um, the subject matter. I thought it was great. Um, from, from a standpoint of, you know, who needs to hear this, you know, this is both history, you know, from, uh, from uh, Texas as well as New Jersey. And I, and I like the fact that they were able to tie, you guys were able to tie in um, the family members who had an influence in South Jersey. I even saw uh, one of the sisters um, uh, taught in Morristown, New Jersey. So I thought that was an interesting point that I picked out uh, from this. So thank, thanks again. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, definitely. It, it just shows how the connections, you know, um, when I'm in the cemetery, like how we're all connected, that those are the stories that I love to, you know, uncover. Get Do Dr. Mary's um, sister, Hattie, was a teacher, a very well-known teacher. Um, she taught in Virginia State, at Virginia State University, and then later um, in Morristown, New Jersey, and that's where she um, lived for the remainder of her life, and she's buried in Mount Key Cemetery. So, an amazing family. Thank you, Jay, for picking up on that. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes, Janice? Hi, I just Hi. Want, I'm Janice Semler Edmund. I just wanted to say I enjoyed the program so very, very much. Thank really you. interesting uh, information. And I have a question about um, Dr. Mary, but I also want to say I'm from, I grew up in Northern New Jersey. Mm -hmm. So it was fascinating <laughs> to hear uh, some of the names of the Jersey cities. Right. Uh, to know that they were, they were there. Dr. Cl Dr. Clement Branch, interesting. Yeah. My question is, I, perhaps I missed it coming in a little late, but I was wondering, um, where did Dr. Mary Branch go to undergraduate school? How, where did she get started with her education? Does anyone know? Yeah, so she actually went to the um, University of Pennsylvania. But she also went to um, the University of Columbia to do summer courses as well. Oh, yes, okay. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. But thank you again. And thank you, Dr. Hudson. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Janice. Any other questions before we sign off? Um, just to let everyone know, I'm going to email all of tonight's attendees uh, a resource list. And it has further reading um, because Dr. Mary is um, in um, several books and uh, resource reference books. So I'm gonna send that to your um, emails. Um, it probably will um, hit your emails tomorrow afternoon. So you can read up some more things about Texas history and Texas female educators and Dr. Mary. Be on the lookout for the, uh, the oral history uh, project by Houston Tillotson. Um, we'll let you know when that becomes available. And Dr. Hudson, when do you think your book will be published? Well, it's it's not a it's not a book. It's really just a a a paper. Okay. Uh, and I I'll be more than happy to share it with everyone. Um, oh. I'll be presenting I'll be presenting the same topic this coming weekend with greater detail. But I'll be more than happy to share it with everyone if you like. Okay. Yeah, we would love that. Definitely. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I think if there's 
there isn't any more questions, I don't see anything in the chat. I think I'm gonna let you all go, but I appreciate, um, this was a wonderful, fascinating um, evening. I, I learned things, it's just wonderful to share our resources and knowledge and be on the lookout for more lectures like this um, from Mount Peace Cemetery um, because we have a lot of people interred and a lot of stories. <laughs> I just want so, to say thank you, Dolly, for a very informative you. evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, to Beverly. Thank you, Beverly. I'm glad you made it. <laughs> thank you, everyone. All right, everyone, you Thank all you. have a good evening. Stay safe, be well. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take, take care. Take care, everyone.